Boom. All right. I think we're all good to go. Right on. My guy, Rod, thank you so much for taking the time out to hop on the Zoom, uh, have a conversation with me, and share everything that, that you're up to, as well as your past and everything you got going moving forward. And so I'm excited to have you on, and I think my guests will find a lot of value in what you have to say. Bro, and I appreciate you having me, man. And uh, uh, we've already had a couple of conversations uh, offline, and uh, I'm excited to jump in. And uh, um, um, I love what you do and what you're about and, and the things you're doing. It's, it's about longevity and, um, and about health and, and, and maximizing the vessel. And, um, and I'm, I'm with you 100%. Yeah, hey, I appreciate that, especially coming from you. And so uh, for all the people who don't know who you are, give us a brief little background on who you are, what you've accomplished, and, uh, and what you're up to. Uh, short version is um, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, uh, uh, played um, high school football, um, went to Notre Dame. Um, I won a national championship uh, in 1988, my freshman year. Um, a couple of guys got injured, quite frankly, and I had a chance to move up and play right away, which was which was nice. Um, yeah. uh, um, got uh, uh, we can get into it more later, but had a traumatic junior season. Got through it with the help of my with my father and and and, uh, and mother and and brother, and uh, came on the other side of it a, a better man, and um, um, was was fortunate enough to. Uh, um, to have a play, have a chance to play in a couple um, All Star games after my senior season, and uh, and and played those games in a way that 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 helped me in the draft dramatically, and ended up going in the second round, thirty fifth pick. I think it's thirty fifth or thirty six, whatever. When I, I should know that right, but <laughs> early second round, whatever. And um, I went to New England, um, played it for three years, two years under Bill Parcells. Um, uh, just phenomenal, and um, uh, and then came to Carolina in '95 expansion draft. I was the the first player picked in the expansion draft. Um, a um, a uh, useless but uh, but consistent um, uh, trivia question at Panthers games. Uh, <laughs> who, who, who's the first Panther ever? And everybody thinks it's Kerry Collins, and then they, they say Rod Smith, and crowd boo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, but you were that number one, though. That's they, 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 they grow and they go, oh, yeah, yeah that guy. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> in Carolina, played here a couple of years, uh, and then um, went to Green Bay uh, uh, in '98, my last year in the league, my seventh year, and um, played with Favre and all those guys, Reggie White and all those superstars, wow. and then and then retired. I had a bad back. I hurt my back my second year in the league, and just and just hung on, and it got really bad. And retired. And then um, got a call from Dan Reeves at Atlanta, wanted me to come out of retirement and, and play some defensive back, play some nickel back and uh, cover kicks and that kind of thing. I, I was always a, um, a good special teams player. Yeah, you know, you know, had good days and bad days at corner, but, but I could always cover kicks and block kicks and, and make life tough for people special teams wise. Yeah. Um, so um, went down to Atlanta and uh, made the team, but hurt my back again week three and retired. Um, and uh, and shut it down. Got, got an MBA. Thought I wanted to get into finance. Um, worked for the bank for junior for a year. Uh, I hated it. A little too political for me. I, you know, I'm not bagging it at all. I mean, banking is you know a marvelous industry, a cornerstone of our, our economy. Of course, it just wasn't it wasn't the right fit for Rob Smith. And oh, yeah. um, ended up uh, calling games for ESPN for a couple of years uh, after I retired. And then um, I met. Uh, Billy Ball, who is a senior vice president for um, 84 Lumber at a wine tasting of all places. Gotta and love um, that. and uh, it turned into visiting the North Charlotte 84 Lumber store. And, um, uh, and I happened to walk in and I saw the leaderboard. And that month, the leading salesperson made $34,000 that month. And I was like, lumber <laughs> sales? Thirty-four thousand in a month. I was like, "Wow!" Oh, I said, I, "I go, I go, I want to meet that guy." He goes, "Oh, he happens to be here. Let me go get him for you." So the guy comes walking out, and still, my I won't mention his name, but he still is <laughs> a friend. Of, he's a still is a friend of mine to this day, like a a a, um, a, um, a mentor and a monster. And uh, he had a he had a he had a ketchup stain on his shirt, he had a, <laughs> shirt on, a ketchup stain, cut off jean shorts, and a dip in his lip. Yes, and I, and, 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 you know, and I thought. I'm in. 
I mean, huh? I, I go, if this dude just made 34 G's, I'm in. So that's how I got into the lumber business. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of iterations in the future. And now I'm running a small cabinet company, uh, uh, Magnolia Installers. We're part of Magnolia Cabinetry. And we do cabinets and countertops for multifamily developers. I, I, I'm a little bit late getting here today because I was on a job site, oh, a yeah. townhome job site, measuring, uh, not measuring, but just, just, just reviewing cabinets that we installed this morning. Um, so forgive me for that, uh, Roman. Oh, but, no worries, no worries. That's, uh, that's my deal. And um, 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 chasing the health thing and, you know, thinking about starting a smoothie company, thinking about starting a health bar company, got some people who are looking at some concepts, um, nothing to announce yet, but, um, um, but, but something may pop there, you know, in the next year or so. So exploring that, I'm, I'm big into, you know, longevity and health and, um, uh, and, um, and research that like you do, I, I go down the wormhole, like chasing that stuff. And, um, I honestly, my goal is to live to 120 and I say live, I don't mean, I don't mean survive. I mean, at 120, be functional and alert and aware and be able to get up, mm. the, get up the floor without using my hands and lift the baby up to, to eye height and, you know, carry two 10 pound bags of groceries up two flights of stairs and all that kind of stuff that you need to do to actually have a, a, a reasonable, reasonably successful life yep. at 120. And I know people, every time I say that people roll their eyes, but the truth is that with modern medicine and what we know about diet and what we continue to learn that I think it's absolutely achievable. And people like um, uh, doctors, Peter Atia, David Sinclair, Rhonda Patrick, those are the, the three, uh, longevity experts, doctors, um, research folks that I, I pay the most attention to, and and they feel the same way. Their goal is all 120. So, you know, I mean, aim at 120. If I get to 110, yay, right? You know what I mean? So, but you've got to like put a mark out there where you want to go, like any other goal. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and at least it's an at least it's an aiming point. You know, I'm not big on like goals. I'm more big on process. But it is good to have a, a point in the future. Or something that you're that you're trying to like. So when you get off track, it, it alerts you. Okay, I'm I'm off track. You know, I'm, I just I just had my second cup of ice cream. Like you 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 wave myself. So, yeah. So that that's the way I think about goals and and and. Uh, but the longevity thing is uh, is uh, is what I'm all about. It's why it's why I train. Yeah. Oh man, I'm right there with you. And so thank you for the the whole background and everything. And shoot, I I don't think for a second that 120 is even scratching the surface what we're going to be doing like here with, ah, the way technology's flowing i mean i remember cord phones yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like and then now look at us we're over here video chat and it's wild yeah. and so i mean just that technology and what it's going to do for us uh later for health is going to be i think is going to be amazing and so um let's dive into some of your uh some of your experiences I'd like to hear a little bit about like some of your transitions. You mentioned your junior and senior year being uh, really big in uh, in your development uh, in sports, really playing good games, putting together a good string of games that helped you kind of get to the NFL. Uh, share a little bit about those two seasons and what your mentality was and uh, and then how it was transitioning from college football to the NFL. Okay, yeah. Um, 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 in high school, uh, a couple things happened, um, um, which um, which had long-lasting effects on kind of where my career went. Um, um, number one was my sophomore year in high school. Uh, the senior running back, we had good football teams at Roosevelt High School. We were always in the top ten, and and uh, our senior tailback, a stud, got injured with four games to go in the season. And uh, I didn't play a down of football until I was a, a freshman in high school. So I was still learning the game um, and throwing up to varsity, getting ready to go into playoffs. Um, and uh, and I won't lie to you, I was scared to death. Ah, oh, geez. I mean, everybody is, you know, everybody's bigger than you. Everybody's older than you. Everybody's stronger than you. You're, I mean, you know, you get where, where, where you are intensely physical as a sophomore, all of a sudden you're, you're, Otherwise, now all of a sudden you can't be physical with anybody. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's that kind of transition. It's being the man on campus as a sophomore, just running over linebackers. And then you go to varsity the next practice, 
and you can't run over anybody. Even the cornerbacks are picking you up and body slamming. So, you know, it was it was horrifying. You know, what I mean, it's scary as all get out. But um, yeah. you know, my I had one of those fathers that would um that would sneak out of work and show up in practice. You know, he was on the board of Rams County Hospital. Um, um, so fortunate. And again, just how all these lucky things that happened. I had a dad that was in position, um, in in his in his work life where he could he could skip out and watch his son and sneak out and watch his son practice. Um, not to see if I was winning or losing or anything like that. You know, the only thing he would say is I, I come to watch practices to make sure that you are, to watch you give the type of effort that you should give. All, all I care about is effort and, and being physical and aggressive and assertive. I don't, you know, forget wins and losses. It's, it's, it's how you play every down. And, um, um, so that's, it's great to get that message. And um, I was getting tossed around and all I have to say is we did this one drill called Oklahoma. Where I had seniors on both sides, you know, it took longer. Gotta so, love Oklahoma's. Oh my God, right? So, right? So, if, if people can understand, there, there are pads on the ground that are about like four feet long, and you have to step over the pad. So, like, you know, it's a foot high and it's a foot wide and it's four feet long, and you have to step over that. Now, you put four of those in a row. So, you gotta step over this, take a couple steps, step over another one, take a couple steps. No big deal, right? But what they do is they put people on both sides of those of those uh those barriers with pads in their hands and they pound you with it and the goal is to try to physically distract the runner okay and they're trying to strip the ball to try to teach you ball security so you don't fumble so i'm a i'm a little punk sophomore with all these stud seniors and they knock me down on the ground and they're kicking me down and they sit the ball out and Coach is like, get the ball out. So now I'm literally on the ground crawling. I feel like I'm going to start crying. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I got tears in my eyes. I'm trying to get the ball. They're, they're kicking the ball away. I'm, I'm, I mean, it was, I, I mean, like, it was brutal. So, um, so I get up and, um, uh, and I get another shot from, from, from Joe Hinder, our inside linebacker, um, senior. And, uh, um, and that was like the deal breaker. And my dad was, in the stand. So I got tears in my eyes. I'm frustrated. I'm mad as all get out. I'm scared. And um, and I thought to myself, I go, you know what? I it literally at that moment, Roman, I thought, that is the that is the last shot that I take. That is that is ab- I am I will never go through this ever mm. again. I know there there will be there will never be another another play a down an instant of passivity on the football field that's the last shot that i'm gonna take and i can i get it i may not win um i'm gonna lose a lot that's fine but everybody the rest of my life is gonna get nothing but pads when they when they face rotsman you can take it so um um so i literally went to the next drill and started trying to run over every single person i could run over and i lost a lot See, that, that's the thing. Like, I, I lost a bunch. I lost half of them easily. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to hit somebody. I'm getting knocked back. Like, like it, it. But what happened is, as I started to be more physical, as I started to attack people, like, I started winning a little more. I started winning a little more. I started learning how to get a little better. And how to, I, got, I started getting better at it. I'm like, okay, hit the guy like this. Yeah. You start getting better. And the next thing you know, after about a week of practice, I was I was a, a standard deviation better, all that, that fast. Um, then the first game, I had a good game, you know, and I and I attacked the opponent, and then and then my teammates were like, "Hey, little sophomore Rod, like, hey, we like the way you." All of a sudden, yeah. you know, instead of attacking me, they, they they hit me softer. They didn't. I, now I became part of the team. I wasn't this skinny sophomore that replaced their friend. They were like, "Hey, kids, go." Yeah. Okay, you went well. So, um, showed your uh, colors a little bit, earned your yeah. stripes. Yeah, you know how it goes in wrestling. Like, like, like you know, like oh, they, I mean, they toss all the freshmen around, and then the one that fights back, they're like, okay, that's the one that's got a little foot spot to him, like this, you know, you got know, some like, minerals. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Like, yeah, you and you come with us. Don't, don't worry about the other freshmen. You, hey, hey, Roman, you, Roman, come practice with us. Like, you come, you you get to be that guy, right? So, um. That's what happened. And then, you know, I go into my junior year and, I, and I'm feeling like a senior because I played four games with the varsity and, and I had gotten over and gotten more physical. So now as a junior, I was feeling like a fifth year senior. 
You know what I mean? I was a junior. Yeah. I was like, nobody out there could stop me. You know what I mean? Like, like, like you know, so, um, <laughs> head of the junior awesome. year. Yeah, it is. And, and then I got, I got, I got really lucky, Roman, because there's a kid named Joel Hamburger. And not, not Joel Hinder, the linebacker. This is, this is Joel Hinder. I'm sorry, Joel Hamburger. And, um, and, uh, and he is like 29 and one against Rod Smith in track. I never beat him. Well, I should say never. I only beat him once. Okay, so up to my, in my junior year, I'm the number two in the state. He's number one. I've never beat him. He's just faster than I am, right? So he gets mono a week before the state track meet. So I go out and I win the 100, 200 long jump. Okay? Because he's not 100. Let's be honest. Let's just keep it real. He's not 100%. But what that did is all of a sudden there's a kid from Minnesota who's all state, but he's also state champion in the 100, 200 long jump. So he's got speed. Speeds mark because the, the knock on kids from Minnesota is that they're slow and they are slow, <laughs> however, and, and we are slow. But after winning those state titles, all of a sudden, oh, he's fast, he's not like other Minnesota kids. Um, had Hamburger run, I'd have lost to him, and I don't know if I go to Notre Dame. I, I, I absolutely think that had I not won that title, had he not been sick, I go to Minnesota. Wisconsin, Indiana State, Purdue, Indiana. Like I'm, I'm, I'm Division One, but I'm, I'm that level. I'm not, I'm not Notre Dame, Michigan, Miami, USC. I'm not Stanford. I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm yeah. Indiana, Purdue, Indiana State. You know, You're in the mix, just, not, not top twenty-five. Yeah, ex exactly. You know, yeah, I'm going there. You know what I mean? I'm not wrestling at Iowa. I'm at like, you know, I'm at Tulsa. You know what I mean? Tulsa yeah. Wrestling but it ain't Iowa, right? Okay. Yeah, you're putting on a singlet, but you're not competing against the same people. <laughs> yeah, but it's, not, it's not Penn State. You know what I mean? It ain't, yeah. it ain't, it's, okay. okay, so um, uh, so that happened, and then it gave me an opportunity to, to be recruited by everybody and all American and all that kind of good stuff. And um, uh, and uh, and yeah, chose Notre Dame because um, you know, my dad and I did a bunch of study, and and 50 percent of NFL players at the time. Um, declared, declared, declared bankruptcy within five years of, of finishing their career. And um, at the time, I don't know what the stat is now, but at the time, I want to say it was like college football was graduating like 54% of their African-American football players. I mean, just over half. That's how, that's how brutal it was. So what that tells me is most schools don't care about the student athletes. Mm -hmm. most, most schools don't. Um, Notre Dame was graduating, Stanford was graduating like 98%, Notre Dame was graduating 99%. Um, and those are the two schools that were my final choices. Because to me, it just seemed obvious that they care about, about graduating their kids and, 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 and not, and it sounds weird, not graduating their kids, Roman, but making sure that no matter what kind of academic credentials a kid entered the school with, that by the time they left the school, that they were a Stanford man or a Notre Dame man. It's different. I'm not talking about pushing anybody through. I'll give you yeah. an example. I'm so proud about this. Um, Notre Dame, if you have less, and again, I don't know what it is right now, but I would imagine it's pretty close to the same. Back then, if you had less than a B average in any class, you had to, you had to see a tutor for 45 minutes, individual, one-on-one, -on -one, per class. So if you're taking five, you could be in study hall from 7.30 to 11. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. like, it could be a long night for you. And, and I won't mention any name, but there were kids that were in study hall the whole time until their junior year. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't joking either. I right ain't on. joking listen, either. Listen, listen, it's, it's, it's no different than lifting weights. If you want to get better, put some time in. You yeah. wanna, if you want to get, get better academically, put your time in. There's no shame. Listen, if you want to get better at anything, put your time in. I, I mean, how do, you, how do you get better? There is no shame. So, um, shoot, I took some, I had some tutors. Let's keep it real. I had some tutors. I had a three, six grade point average, but I had a couple of tutors, no doubt. I had a couple, the philosophy wore me out and uh, economics <laughs> wore me out my first time. So, I was in, I, no, no shame in my game. Yeah. So, all that, to say that. Is, all that to say is, if, 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 um, and I want I want to get get too high on my soapbox, but but universities um, that that put that type of emphasis on getting their kids up to speed, and obviously with the tutors, where I was like, our goal is to make sure that everybody graduates a Notre Dame man, just like every Notre Dame man before him or or, or after him. 
I mean, like, our goal is not to get you through. Our goal is to get you up to speed. You know what I mean? That's yeah. different. Like, yeah. So, like, um, so I fell in love with the Stanford had the same mantra. Stanford, hey, listen, you got less than a B. You got you have a you have a one on one tutor. We're gonna get you. We're gonna get you up to speed. By the time you graduate, you'll be equal to any other Stanford man. And I I love that. So Notre Dame was a choice, and um, um, uh, and uh, you know I I knew we were gonna be good. We had um, we had six of the eight uh, Prado American running backs in that in that class go. Notre Dame had the number one recruiting class in the country like six years in a row. And this wow. was like maybe like maybe, this is maybe like the second year in a row. My my class. Um, um, but uh, like my dad said, listen, if you're gonna be, if you're any good, let's go find out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't, again, I don't throw any names out there, but some coaches of of top five caliber schools, and I'm not kidding you, Roman, literally said to me, "Why would you go to Notre Dame? They've got five parade all American running backs already signed." And I was kind of like, "Really?" So. How do you know they're better than me? Maybe, maybe what you should do is call them and ask them why they committed to Notre Dame, thinking knowing that Rod Smith was thinking about going. I mean, like, like so. Yeah. I'm, so you're telling, so you're saying to me, I, it, it, it makes me mad thinking about it. I, I, I never. I, I, <laughs> I can see you at, checking for goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking at the coach. I was like, did you just say that I should be scared of five men I've never met? I have no idea how tough they are. I don't know. Maybe you know. I don't know. I mean, maybe I go there and find out that they're all better than me. And if that's the case, so be it. Then, then I know where I stand. But you're telling me that I should be fearful? That I should avoid competition? I go, you, I go, you got the wrong guy. I go, no. you got the wrong guy. I go, this, this, this visit is officially over. I mean, I'm going to enjoy the next day, but I can't wait to get off your campus because I don't, I, I don't roll like that. Like, that, that's not the way we do things in my family. We're like, listen, we, we go to where the competition is. We're, we're the best players in the world. Let's go play with them. I mean, if, if, we're, if we're good, let's go find out. I mean, you know, yeah, so. that, that mentality sounds like the mentality you had before you were in that Oklahoma drill getting beat on and decided to change your mindset. <laughs> That's what that looks like, because you became an unstoppable force. You changed your mind, and you became that guy. And But that mentality, you, you can't go somewhere thinking you're, oh, I'm going to go here thinking these guys are better than me. Whew. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, and, I, and I'm always in, in, um, in for, uh, in, in granted, there may be a deficit of strategy on my part on occasion. I, I own that. However, whenever I hear kids talking about, oh, I'm going to go to this school, that school, because they don't have any quarterbacks on the roster, I just kind of go, I go, you're ducking the competition. I go, hey, you're ducking. I go, you should go to the place with all the quarterbacks. Like, go, go to the place where the best players are and beat somebody's tail. Like, go, go take somebody's job. I mean, like, go, go step up. You know, don't try to find a place where you can just fit in. And, and I'm not saying don't work to your strengths, of course, but yeah. like, that the whole trying to avoid competition thing is just not my bag. And um, and I remember the coach telling me that. I was just like, wow. I mean, a Hall of Fame coach, not like a, some guy, like oh. a Hall of Fame. I was just like, I was like, how are you a, such a good coach? Like, how do, you, how do you operate like that? Like, what kids do you tell that you say that to are motivated to come here because they think <laughs> they can avoid competition? I mean, are, are, is that the way you recruit? Like, that's bad. That's a bad look. So, I went to Notre Dame with all these great players, knowing that I was probably going to get, I wasn't ever going to play tailback. I mean, they're, you know, when you got guys like Ricky Waters and Jerome Bettis and Rocket Ishmael running around, Anthony Johnson, listen, Rod Smith ain't playing much tailback. I, I listen, listen, I know that, but, I, but, but I'm just going to go and compete. I'm just going to yeah. go and fight. You know, I, I don't, I don't know it's Jerome Bettis until I see it. Now I know it's Jerome Bettis, but, 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 I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I didn't know. Was Joe Burrow in the house, right? So, yeah. um, so ended up moving to, to, to wide receiver as a freshman, and then defensive back after that, and uh, um, and had a, had a nice career, and uh, um, you know, played in a bunch of big games: Miami, Michigan, Michigan State, USC, um, Penn State. Just I mean, some just monster night games, national television, twenty-seven million people watching. Cool. Um, we got spoiled in our day. I mean, it was just, it was, it was just. It was sick. I mean, now it was it was 
it was um it was earned. I mean, the practices were savage. I mean, Coach Holtz is a is a man on man grinder, physical, toughest guys play. So practices, I mean, for all people say, oh, you guys got the training table and you've got, you know, these private plates and all that. Like, listen, man, listen, that is earned because you know, you gotta go one on one with Jerome Betters for about three and a half hours every day. You've earned that, you've earned that steak you're about to eat that night. I mean, trust me, like, like not a lot of people are going to trade that steak for that for Ricky Waters for, th for for three hours. You know what I mean? Or trying to cover Rocket Ishmael. That can get ugly quick. Yeah. So um, um, it was uh, we had a very physical style of play and, and, and style of practice, which fits my method because I'm a I'm a little guy and have some speed, but I'm not a I'm not a finesse player. I was a grinder, a meat grinder. I could get my hands on guys and knock guys down and make guys quit. That was that was my deal. I want I want I literally. It's so funny. I literally wanted my goal was to make the person across from me never want to see me again. My, my goal is <laughs> at the end of every game. My goal is I want to make sure that whoever I'm playing against, when they, when they say Ross Smith, the person just goes, "Oh, shoot, no, please tell me not that." I mean, that's that's my goal. So, um, um, so yeah, that was a that was a that was a how I try to play. Man, that's that's awesome. And like everything you were saying, kind of spoke with me too, because. Um, West Virginia is number one party school. And so there was like, their graduation rate is only 54%. Wow. It's like somewhere low like that. And wow. And, and so it's like, and not because it's difficult. I mean, it's number one party school. It's, and so that's more of the reason why. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of hard to like stay focused, stay dialed in. Luckily I had wrestling on my side. Um, and then it was like, but like deciding to wrestle D1 was huge for me because i had been going to ncaa's for a couple years in yeah high school and i had decided in my head i was like this is where i want to wrestle it's like i don't want to wrestle at the d2 level i don't want like like you said it's like i want to put myself in the best competition so that i can kind of see what kind of man i actually am and not just go win something that's a little bit easier because i'm not facing the competition that is truly the, the level that i want to compete at yeah um, and so i mean very average college wrestler but I like that I was testing myself against the best in the nation rather than being one of the best in a league that the best in the nation aren't in. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, um, that, um, 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 that, you know, the attitude of, of, um, of, you know, it, it reminds me of like David Goggins. Um, and I didn't listen to the podcast, but I listened to a lot of David Goggins and a lot of Jocko Willick and, um, I just saw the I just saw the, the the title and it said it said it said keep yourself uncomfortable and I and I just looked at it and was like my man I I didn't, I didn't have a time to look at it but it, it popped in my feed I just went <laughs> I went I went exactly I mean it just, it just makes you want to go test yourself against something that that's uncomfortable you know I, I have a I have affirmations one of my affirmations. I say every morning in the mirror three times. One of my affirmations is, I love myself enough to do the things I don't want to do. Mm. I love myself enough to do the things that I don't want to do. I love myself enough to do the things I don't want to do. And at some point in the day, um, it, it pops in my mind when I'm like, oh, I'm not doing that. Oh, taxes. Oh, geez, <laughs> business taxes. Oh, please. And I, go, and I go, oh. I go, no, 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 no. I don't want to do it, which means I probably should do that. You know what I mean? Like, like oh. So, and it's funny. I'm kind of jumping off the train here a little bit. But oh, like, we're good. But like we're roaming but around. Like, <laughs> but like, <laughs> no doubt. No, I love it. Um but like like uh Roman like five years ago, um um and I can't remember what, what book I was reading at the time, but um they were they were talking about affirmations and I've always thought that affirmations were for weak minded people. Like if you can't motivate yourself then maybe you need to write it on the wall and read it every day like yeah maybe that's you. That's not me. Now yeah. and, and, and I was an idiot. I was an idiot. I, I, don't, I mean, you, you know, and I don't do a thing you don't know you don't know. If you don't know, you should probably figure it out or like at least try to understand your world well enough to know where your gaps are. So I, I don't that excuse. I'm like, well, I didn't know. Well, you should have figured it out that you didn't. Anyway, all I can say is um, um, I tried like three affirmations and nothing happened. I said, I'm going to do this for a year. Nothing happened for like six months. And then all of a sudden I was in a meeting with a client and it was going bad and it like popped in my head that like, um, I'm always calm, under control, and speak slowly. I'm always calm, under control, and speak slowly because I'm a hothead. So 
I'm always calm when I'm in trouble. All of a sudden, I could hear my mantra in my head that was saying, Rob, hey, hey, calm down, man. Calm down. Like, you're getting mad. You're taking it personal. I'm always calm, under control. It's being so you see, You hear me talking. I started to slow it down already. So, yeah. like, it, you can program your mind. It, it really is what you put in. It, it rotates and stays in there and bounces around. And if you keep putting positive things in your mind, um, intentional ideas in your mind, over time, they will, they will become you. They, they, will, they will start to infect your behavior. And now, you know, I try to limit it to five, but like, I'm a huge believer. I, I, every morning I take him on the road with me. I think, I mean, like, I'm, I'm a, um, I'm a big believer in, in self-programming. You know what I mean? You keep yeah. programming it. And, um, 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 and that's one of them for me was I'm always calm under control and speak slowly. Um, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm rational because I don't take it personally. I'm oh, yeah. rational. I'm rational because I don't take it. If, if, if something hits you emotionally, you're taking it personal. Now you're, the emotional center breaks out. Your amygdala gets fired up, and the cortex shuts down. There, it's yeah. it's an you're out of the game. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. It's an auto. It's not. It's an automatic reaction. When your emotion goes up, your cortex goes down. It's every human being on the planet. If this goes up. This goes down. So I can't be rational if I take it personal. So when something hits me now, and I go. Mother, then I go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, yeah, oh, wait a minute. you pull yourself back. Yeah, you know, someone said, hey, man, you're, you're, you're always late with the cabinets. I go, I go, oh, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute Ron. You can't, you can't use your brain if you're mad. So let's calm down. Okay, listen. Okay, all right, Carlos, tell me why you feel that way. Now I can, now I can ask a question and I can get more information. Well, and we can figure it out. But if I respond like I want to respond, you know, you know what I mean? Like, bring me, you know, I'll meet you in the parking lot. Let's go. Let's figure this out. I'll show you late cabinets right now at my car. I mean, like, you know, that, that's not going to move the needle. So yeah. all that to say is the affirmations and programming your mind, wherever anybody, wherever you want to go, like, um, have been extremely valuable for me um, over the years. And I, I, I live by them now. Yeah, I'm big on those too, just because I, I heard it somewhere and I might be messing up these numbers, but it was saying that like pe people, humans speak at like 100 words a minute, but we think at like 300 words a minute. And I was thinking like, man, like what is my, like what kind of thoughts am I having? What am I telling myself at 300 words a minute? And it's like one, and then that's what meditation started doing for me was allowing me to see my thoughts that I was actually having and being able to navigate around and be like, why am I actually having this negative thought about me? Like, cause I mean, they like, I'll say the meanest stuff to myself, but I won't say anything mean about like the people around me, but it's like, yeah. we're, we're our hardest critic. And so I was like, why am I having all these negative thoughts coming at me so fast all the time? And so then it's like, once you start changing those and you can put like calm and collected and I'm in control of my own destiny and all these different stuff, you start empowering yourself to like you give yourself the permission to have a different stance in different positions and just have that self-awareness to know that like hey i might be crawling down that bad path that dark path that that ain't mine and taking it personally let me back up a little bit let me respect the person across from me and understand that they're coming from a completely different place that i have no idea yeah what, yeah what they're holding on to what journey they've been on anything like that and so let me just be on my keel let me control what i can't control and I can support everybody else. Yeah, that's oh. what's up, man. That's what's up. Tell, yeah, listen, I, I know I'm not. I'm supposed to be doing some talking here, but like, tell me a little bit about your about your meditation journey. I I started out a meditation journey myself um, a couple of years back, um, around the same time as is um, affirmations, and um, and I'm I'm down now to um, ten minutes in the morning and ten minutes at night. It's kind of my wake up in the morning. I wake up. And then I'm like, okay, I lay back down and give myself 10 minutes and just, and like you, like you just clear the thoughts and just clear the thoughts and then and just watch the thoughts come by and then put them in the boat and let them go down the river. And then another thought comes in, take it, take that thought, acknowledge it, put it in the boat, let it go down the river. And then all of a sudden, then you start seeing the lights. You know what I mean? You, you I love the lights. Yeah. <laughs> when you're following the lights, that's when you know you're, you're getting close. <laughs> I'm so glad that you mentioned the lights because I've been hitting the lights hard. Like, <laughs> 
That's what I I'm, I'm so glad. I feel like it's me because when when your brain waves start getting alpha, you literally like just see like colors and like yeah. lights and stuff, and you're just like wow. And, and then you know you're, and then the, and the thoughts stop. All you all you see your lights, but there's no there's no thought path going anymore. The the river goes away, and it's just light. Oh, it's it's the cool. And then you get out of bed, and you're like you. are you're balanced yeah. and you're like, let's do this. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. I'm, awesome. I'm right there with you. I, I started about, probably about a year and a half ago, I started meditating every morning after mm -hmm. listening, to, listening to, reading, and hearing a podcast of, from Joe Dispenza. And he's right been, on. if you haven't heard of him, definitely look up, look up yeah, him. Have, because, yeah. and, and so I started, I'm, I'm usually at like 20 to 30 minutes every morning. I'll sit, I'll sit and meditate and uh it's the first thing i do i have an eye pillow that i put over my eyes just because i if i have to like physically like close my eyes i'll, I'll start opening up a little bit and just like yeah. looking out and so i put yeah. the eye pillow on so that i don't have to focus on closing my eyes i can just yeah. relax i got yeah. a weighted blanket too i put that over yeah. me just because i get cold sometimes when i meditate Sometimes i've got, I've got one <laughs> yeah if i get into long meditations i'll actually find myself in deep breathing I'll find myself wanting to curl up in a fetal position too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I like the weighted blanket just because it kind of comforts me. Um, yeah. But I've uh, like, I started doing that every morning and then my self-awareness just shot up. It skyrocketed. I mean, I was, I was, uh, my, it was my self-awareness. And then it was like, like you said, discovering the thoughts that were coming through my head on a daily basis, because Joe was saying that 90% of the thoughts you had yesterday are the same ones you're going to have today. And then you're essentially like, if you wake up and the first thing you do is check your phone every morning and you bring in the problems from yesterday into today, you're essentially going to take those problems from today into tomorrow. And you're essentially stacking yesterday onto today. And then you're living a cycle. And so I wanted to just break myself out of that cycle. And so uh, lots of meditation. And, and it's, it's funny because I actually, once I like, so I found the meditation, the meditative state, the goal, essentially, to let go of everything in a um, sensory deprivation tank, in a float mm -hmm. tank, down mm -hmm. in uh, Huntersville. I, yeah, I well, well, hold on, was it, was it, uh, God, what was it? I used to go there um, before, before the pandemic. They, uh, they don't have it, or the, the original people that had it closed it down, but it was, uh, then it reopened. It's right off. It's right there off of. Uh, is it off of Twenty One? You come up the exit. You take a left. You go. You go across the highway. Then you take the other left. And it's right up there. Yeah, yeah. it was right yeah. off Sam Fur. Um, yes, and, and uh, and the guy that buoyancy, buoyancy. Yeah, buoyancy. Yeah, that's yeah. I knew it was Bob. I think I believe it was Bob that owned it. Are they still open? Uh, they sold it, but I was so happy that I found those guys because they had a killer deal back then that they didn't know what they were sitting on. It was a, it yeah. was sixty dollars for an hour or a hundred dollars yeah. unlimited for a month. And I was yeah. like, I got out. I was like, can I make the decision after my first float? And he was like, yeah. And so I came out of the first float and I paid the next four months ahead. Yeah. And I just yeah. started going three to four times a month or three to four yeah. times a week. I was in there a lot. Yeah. Listen, we must've passed each other because I did the same thing. I was like a hundred dollars unlimited. I was like, <laughs> okay. And, and, and I was in the float tank at least twice a week, every week. And, and I was doing, then I, then I made it 150 bucks. And I was doing, like I was going ninety minute sessions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going hard. I mean, it's it. How good is that? Are you kidding me? Yeah, and yeah. One, and so once I found that like goal state, then I like I noticed that I had been in that state before. That that wasn't the first time I had been there. And so I had found it in the flow state in wrestling. I'm a sports psychology major, and so I, I was learning about flow state, and I was like, okay, I've been in that flow state before. So then it was like, all right, now I see it again in the float tank. I saw it again when I really started getting good at yoga. And started like I felt like my yoga practice uh, really became more of a meditation, a movement meditation. Once I could close my eyes and not have to look to the person next to me to know what the next position was. So then mm -hmm. I saw it in yoga, and then I saw, and then I was like, "All right, let's just try and get this without any movement, but without going into a float tank." And so then I wanted to get there in meditation, and so it was all just kind of figuring out like different ways to get it, and then how to get to that state in whatever state I was currently in, whether it be wrestling, yoga, working out, float tank, or in the cover of my bed. Like that's, it was, that's kind of how my meditation practice started. And shit, I mean, I just ran with it ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I love it. And I did the same thing. I was at the buoyancy and 
um, um, and and just loved it. I had to get out of the salt, out of the flow tank. I was in there. I was in there like I every really day. For a while. <laughs> I, it, it, I mean, because when you get out, you feel so. I mean, I mean, you get out of the. You get out. If, if anybody hasn't done it, you get in the float tank, and it's it's a water with like eight hundred pounds of salt in it, and you float like a cork on it, and it's completely pitch black and completely silent. And the first time you're in it, you're 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 kind of waiting for it to end. It feels like it's never going to end. And then the next thing you know, you're seeing these lights are flashing by, like, it, like your brain, and then, and then it's over. And you're like, wait a minute, how long was it in there? And they're like, we actually gave you another half hour. You were in there for 90 minutes. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and, and it feels yeah. like you're going to be in there forever. And then it feels like you were in there for five minutes. When they open the, when they open the thing and say, hey, time to get out, you feel like you've been in there for five minutes. It's, it's the most insane thing ever. And, and I like driving home because, like I can see, I can see every branch of every tree and every leaf. So vivid. It, I mean, like the the colors of the world, like the sky. The, I can I can tell the clouds are moving southeast at like six <laughs> miles an hour, and there's yeah. a and there's a and there's a there's a there's, a, there's an eagle flying over here, and there's a and the car behind me has a woman in it with glasses on, who's looking at her phone. I mean, you can you can notice. All this stuff at the same time, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's different. And then the last thing I wanted to touch was my cellular device. Oh! The oh. last thing. Well, I want, the last thing, I, I, I didn't want anything to do with that piece of equipment. I was like, every color is more bright. Everything is more vivid. I can start, I start seeing more. I start, like, noticing more. Things I never noticed. I was like, I just drove down that road an hour before. And then I'm like, what the heck is all this stuff? Like, yeah, <laughs> and it's like the last thing I wanted was anything to do with technology. It was like, if anything, I wanted to just go to the mountains and, and, and bathe in a creek. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love it. I love it. You know, it's crazy. It's funny you say that because I tell people, listen, if they you know, if I, I kept telling people, Hey, you gotta go float. You gotta go float. You know, that you, you, when you, um, um, when you send somebody up there for the first time, their first floats for free or whatever. So I, I kept sending my friends to go float. Yeah. And um, I would say, listen, make sure you turn the music down on your in your car when you get out of your car. Because if you don't, however level, whatever level it was when you got out, when you get back in, it's going to be the last. It's gonna be, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's going to be yeah. so, going to be like, was I listening to, the, to that? It is, you're so, you're so sensitive to the sound. Like, it's going to be like, It'll be too much. You'll just go. You'll just go. Oh my God! Like turn it down. I'm like yeah, you can't. You cannot do electronics at all. I, I just turn it off and just yeah. drive home and just hear. And you can hear your tires on the road. You can hear the tires and you can hear your engine. You're like, wow. I mean, it's it's insane. It's truly the only place where nothing is going on. Nothing. And that and yeah. and and that's a great place to be mentally too. Cause it's like, cause like I said about the 300, whatever words that are going through our heads and whatever thoughts, things like that, it is so nice to just be able to turn that off. And so it's like finding that in a meditation in my bed. So I don't have to go to a float tank all the time. I mean, the physical benefits of a float tank are like what they are with all the magnesium and everything inside the salt bath. But having that mental clarity in my, in my bed is that's something that I will never take for granted. I mean, it's, and, and then, and then everything else it taught me, like, it doesn't matter if I'm, it doesn't matter if I'm in my bed now, I know what state I need to get to, to have that clear mental thought. Um, and I've had just so much practice over the years now that it's like, I can change my state in an instant just by, excuse me, I'm gonna take a moment and then I'll just go by myself, take a couple breaths, relax, and I'll be right back. Boom. Yeah. Like, yeah. You can find that state. And, and I've actually, I've, I actually have some equipment that I use. It's like a, it's a, a psychophysiological monitor that I put on my ear and it allows me to basically measure my uh, brain and heart coherence. Yeah. I'll tell you more about it. It's a, it, Joe, Joe Dispenza offers it on his website. And, um, but like, it shows you like red, you're not in coherence. Like your, your brain waves aren't at the same level that your heart's at. And as you like get better, you'll start seeing your coherence go up. And so now it's like, I know when my coherence is down. I know when my heart and my brain aren't in the same, same rate. And now I can change it. Boom. I can get back up to this level where I'm vibrating high, essentially. Right on. Oh, so it's, it's, it's badass, man. It's, 
it, it's almost like uh, it's like wrestling, but with my brain. It's like a martial art, but just in my head. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And, um, and I absolutely can relate to your experience with yoga because as, as, as my yoga practice developed and developed, that's exactly what it came down to. It, it literally was, um, it was, it was therapy at 5.30 a.m. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't even about the, like, the movements anymore. It was just, it was just about, like, about eyes being closed and doing as much practice as I could with my eyes closed and just, and just feeling the body and then seeing the colors and, like, and feeling, like, feeling the breath and just, like, it, it, it becomes a, um, and I had to do as much yoga as I can with my eyes closed. I just wanted to like isolate my brain from like any distraction. Um, and the movement is just a way to like slowly bring the body to where the mind is. You know what I mean? And you bring the mind to the body and the body to the mind. It's kind of both are both are coming toward each other in the yoga practice. And then you lay on the ground and you do savasana and like and like someone's got a shake rod because I mean like I'm I am so far down the lights and like just staring at the things and I can hear people getting up, but I'm, but the lights are still here. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's both worlds. Like I can hear what's going on out there, but I, but I'm in this thing too. It's, I mean, yoga is, you know, it's just the, the sickest thing ever. And, uh, um, you know, it, you, like you said, you've got to get past being in pain because listen, five, three yoga, they eat this up. <laughs> I mean, it, when you first start, <laughs> listen, I mean, like, you're going to get your butt kicked, right? Like, it takes a minute to get physically where you're comfortable. But once you get there, it is, uh, it's a, a beautiful, amazing practice. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've had so many practices that I thought were going to go, like, we're going to be shitty. Like, I'm like, I don't want to be here. Like, I don't like, but then by the, by like 30 minutes in, it's like, Roman, shut up. You're here. <laughs> let's let's enjoy this practice let's get the most out of it and then it's like once i kind of get past that and like my body's warmed up and and then like i like slow flows too because like i don't like tons of poses so i don't do I. I don't need all that that's it's it's like i like more of the i do it for the stretching aspect yes yeah. mobility and so um yeah and so like halfway through the practice of my worst practices i'd still have the back half which definitely made up for the first half the front end so yeah yeah i'm right there with you question for you shoot um i i read this somewhere i might have even seen it on like instagram or something some little kid was like like saying like when you close your eyes do you see pictures like like can you picture yourself say at a beach or when you close your eyes like because i close my eyes i can't really picture myself at a beach when i close my eyes i see the lights i see the colors and i see that i don't like are you able to see items? Because I haven't had many experiences with people that notice the lights like I do. Like, I'm like, I follow those lights. And I, I truly believe at some point I'm going to look into the light and then I'm going to take off into that, into that next level. Yes. I, I, uh, there are two things I'll say. One is um, I'm a big believer in the lights. For me, and again, I don't even know exactly. I think it's I like, I think it's alpha waves. I think it's when the brain, you know, is doing this. And then when you calm your thoughts, and you keep coming. This is just my turn. It could be dead wrong, but, yeah, but my no. feeling is that, like, like sleep, but awake. You, when you calm your mind down, because there's so much stuff around us all the time. But when you get in a dark room, and you close your eyes, and you're still, and you're just relaxing and relaxing and breathing, and focus on just breathing and thoughts coming. And, and once you start to slow, slow things down for your brain, it goes out the way. And when it does that, all of a sudden those lights and colors that move, I, I start seeing those. Um, 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 that's one thing. I'll tell you one other really trippy thing that's happened um, lately, um, cognitively or, or um, um, uh, I don't want to say metaphysically, but like, but, but happening in my consciousness is, um, Roman, you may have experienced this too. Um, um, for the first time in my life, not all the time, but on occasion, like maybe like once a week, I can I can literally see myself through somebody else. And, and I don't mean like I'm standing, I'm not I'm not saying I'm standing in my girl's shoes looking at myself, but that like that like I'm a camera over her head looking at me and I and I can and I can like observe 
the way I'm acting and what I'm saying, not in the real time. This is like kind of kind of thinking about a conversation, but I can mm -hmm. I can almost see myself through her eye from her from her angle, a, a, a completely different vantage point of like your facial expressions, your tone of voice, like being able to to see yourself not not from a first person perspective but from a third person perspective like like a camera watching watching me um and it and, and it and it's a uh, you're muted um, there you go but it's, um, i i think it absolutely has to do with meditation and being consistent about it i mean i only go 10 minutes in the morning 10 minutes at night but, I, but i'm hitting it like I'm probably 19 out of 20 days, you know, consistent. So, so you know, the more you meditate, the faster you get in, right? You know, and, and like you said, the one last thing I said quickly, but you said, I, I want to jump on that too, is that you're 100% right. The, the benefits of, of the time that it takes to get into meditation practice are, are 50 fold. And one of them is like you, like I can literally just close my eyes, take a deep breath and just kind of let, just kind of observe what I see, the colors right now, I'm seeing red and kind of a dot where my screen is. And like, and that alone just like, just gives you, just gives you a little, just, just, just everything comes, the heart rate goes down, blood pressure goes down, like, like brain waves slow, you know, ease slow down a little bit. Like you can quickly like, like get yourself in a, in a better place, not full meditative state, but like yeah. calm, calm the engine a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I experienced wow. that same thing. Yeah, I've I've had a I've had a little bit of experience of what you're saying with like the the because I've had I've had meditations where especially with Dr. Joe because like I actually did one that was an hour and forty five minutes the other day that blew my mind. Like when you hear like Tony Robbins and all these other like uh big uh big names saying like you'll wake up from a meditation and walk that life that you're gonna leave that you're gonna leave. Yeah. I had that happen the other day and I was like, holy wow like, it was like an hour 45 minutes i mean i woke up and my i was breathing so heavy i woke up in a puddle of sweat my hands were like this like they were stuck cramps forearms cramps and i woke up and i was like everything was bright and it was it was wild but i had that almost like bird's eye view because he always talks about he, he's like think of your the space between your ears think of your space between your torso the space between your legs think of all that space then think of the space in the room and that's where I kind of zoomed out and I saw myself and I saw the home that I'm currently in. I saw the neighborhood and I saw the globe, essentially. That Wild is stuff. so cool. Wow, that is Wild awesome. stuff. It, yeah. It's, and wow, it's like, so sick. yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know what I was thinking. Like, I didn't even know. I was like, I'm going to plan a meditation. And so then I always go on YouTube. I type in guided meditation. I'll type in like Eckhart Tolle or... Yeah. Uh, Joe Dispenza and I found Joe and then there was an hour and 45 minute one I was like hey I ain't got nothing to do tonight click <laughs> and then yeah. I just had this crazy meditation it's wild I'm, I'm, I'm glad oh, that I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta find that you got me fired up now I'm doing that uh, oh I'm man hey that. I'll, I'll send you the link yeah please please send me that link absolutely yeah I'll even put it in like the in the YouTube show notes and everything just so that other people can have it have it uh, for them as well but Roger, I'm glad man. we got on to this topic because that was <laughs> that that was something I didn't expect to talk with you about that I'm damn damn sure glad we did. Right on. Um and so let's go into a little bit of about your the longevity, uh the stuff that you've been uh diving into recently and um have a lot of passion in and stuff that I, I see you doing. Uh things like the sprout smoothies and uh and working out and like you you talked about being able to get up without using your hands and hold and like hold a toddler up put a suitcase overhead compartment type things. And so uh, what, what kind of stuff are you doing uh, to be able to uh, lengthen that longevity for yourself? Right on. Um, there's a, there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of things that, that, that I'm focusing on. And, and again, I'll, I'll say it again, but like, you know, Rhonda Patrick, David Sinclair and Peter Tia are the folks that I, that I go to for longevity advice. And um, um, everything I say is kind of coming from those three, you know, in different parts. But um, one is on the, on the diet side, um, um, I'm basically a, a 
a intermittent fasting keto type mm-hmm. lifestyle is what I do. So for me, um, now I'm 50. So at 50, different than when I was 30, um, I found out that the hard way that that I'm I am better off training in a in a non-fasted state after say 10 hours. So well, let, me, let me back up. So so here's the deal. So so I I I'm 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 living a a um, keto slash reduced carbohydrate carbohydrate carb, reduced sugar lifestyle. Okay, and um and we can get deep into it, but the the, the short of it is it um it reduces oxidative stress. Um, it reduces um, uh, the likelihood of um, of, um, of, uh, several, of metabolic disease, and that includes cancer. That's respiratory. That's that's cardiorespiratory. Uh, cancer um, um, are really the big ones, you know. And and and, uh, and it keep and it lowers inflammation. So I'm trying to keep inflammation low, and then lower the the um, um, the opportunity for for cancer uh, and for um, cardiovascular disease, those those are the big killers. So mm-hmm. so I'm keeping those down by, by through the diet, and then I intermittent fast. So on days that I'm not working out, I absolutely will not eat anything until noon. And then a lot of times, if I'm not hungry, I'll I'll take it all. I'll just take it to dinner and and do OMAD one meal a day. You know, if I'm not hungry and it's two o'clock and I'm busy, I'll just keep working. I'll just drink more water, keep working, and I'll have and have a huge dinner. Um, yeah. you know, in that, in that, you know, in that, that 16 hour time gap, when you're not eating allows, you know, your intestines, your stomach to heal and optimize, which gives you greater access to the food that you eat. And, um, and, uh, and, the, and it also keeps insulin levels down because we eat and insulin levels go up and then we eat again, they go up and they go eat again, they go up. So the average person on the Western diet is having breakfast lunch and dinner they have breakfast the insulin goes up they have lunch it goes back up again it doesn't it never goes down it goes up and when it goes up it stays up for eight hours so it goes up eight hours you have lunch it stays up you have dinner it stays up you have dinner at 8 30 eat kind of late have a snack at 10 o'clock then you have breakfast at seven your insulin goes down for about two hours and goes right back up the human body's not built for insulin levels to be at eating level for 22 hours a day or 20 yeah. hours, it, it's meant to like, to have to have it go up, stay up for eight hours and go down for eight hours and then go up for eight hours and then down for eight hours. Like, but the way, the way, uh, and I won't throw any names out here, but, but food companies literally put food in, put sugar in food, not to make you happy, but to, but to addict you to that, to that sugary high, that, that feel, and keeping your insulin up. And the thing about insulin that's scary is that, is that when insulin levels are high, um, the body can't produce ATP. And ATP, I'm sorry, the liver produces ATP. So when insulin levels are high, your liver can't produce ATP. So your, your liver can't tell your brain that you're satisfied. Okay? Oh, man. So, so that's why if you wake up in the morning and you wake up in the morning and you have pancakes with syrup, you just had 80 grams of carbohydrates, right? And you've had maybe more than, maybe like 120 grams of carbohydrates. And with that I like syrup, pancakes. I, 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 who doesn't? I, 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 I doesn't? I'm not hating. Yeah, I'm not, no, no. So, so you have pancakes and you have syrup. And so you got, you've got, um, and you've got butter. So you got fat in there too. And butter is great for you, but just not with sugar. So, so you have, you know, 120 grams of carbohydrates and you have 30 grams of sugar. So your insulin level is going to be up for probably about 10 to 12 hours. But here's what happens. When your insulin levels are that high, your, your liver can't, can't produce ATP, which is a chemical that tells your brain that you're satisfied, which is why you're hungry at lunch. Which is why you're yeah. starving at dinner. If I take anybody, if you if you go three months and you go with me and you and you have dinner by eight o'clock and you do not eat anything until noon, do that for three months. And then what's gonna happen is your 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 hunger is gonna is gonna nose up because the liver goes, Oh, insulin the insulin's not going up. And so it's eight o'clock in the morning and insulin's gone. 
and your and your brain and your the liver starts producing ATP saying, hey, we're actually good on food. We we because think about this. If you've got extra fat around your body, you're good on food. You, yeah. you don't need more energy. All the energy you need is in your gut right now. And, and I'm not talking trash, I'm being I mean serious. When when the body's carrying extra fat tissue, that is stored fuel. That's fuel that the body is looking around going, we got this extra glucose. What do we do? We don't need it for muscles, so let's just put it in fat cells. That's why you're fat, because that that your body is keeping energy. So you don't need food. So like well, then why am I hungry if I've got if I've got a little gut rot listen i'm not throwing shade because i was 208 pounds three years ago fat as i'll get out so like listen I, i'm not this isn't like yeah. i know because i was that dude drinking beers fat as gut i was that guy so so um i've lived it so it's when you when the insulin levels go up and in the body's shoveling this extra glucose into the fat cells because your body doesn't need it the liver can't produce atp to tell the brain that we're satisfied so you're hungry at lunch you're hungry at dinner. I mean, if you ever like wake up and have like pancakes in the morning, you're gonna be starving at noon. You're gonna be starving yeah. because because the liver can't tell the brain we've had enough. But even though, think about this. Think about the position the body's in. Somebody that actually has extra fat on their body and is still hungry. I mean, like 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 just back up a second. Think. Why would the body? What what about the body could make it hungry? when it already has energy stores in excess it's the liver not being able to produce the, the chemical that tells you you're satisfied and that's because your insulin levels are so high well not that they're so high but that they stay up you never you never let them go down so all i have to say is a long explanation for a short answer but 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 intermittent fasting gives your body a break so that can, that eight hours can pass and the insulin can go down. And when it goes down, all of a sudden the liver goes, oh, we're good, Rod. It starts throwing out ATP. My brain goes, oh, we're satisfied. So then you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry. Like if you ever heard somebody talk about, I'm not hungry in the morning. I don't eat breakfast. Because they're not hungry. Because their insulin levels are low. So the brain, so the liver is kicking ATP to the brain. The brain's going, we don't need food. But if, but, if you're, but if you're eating sugar all the time, keep your insulin levels up, it makes you more hungry, which is how they get us, which is why they like want you to have ice cream or they want you to have French fries and they want you to have, they want you to have a shake. They want you to have soda because every time you drink a soda, and that's why they put sugar in baby food. They start doing that to try yeah. to get the baby addicted. Because if you can get a baby addicted to sugar and keep its insulin level high, that baby's going to be hungry all the time. He's going to eat more food. You'll sell more food. And as an adult, that kid's going to have it, 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 probably diabetes, but he's also going to have hungry. He's going to eat sugar and want sugar all the time. And a kid can't, a kid can't control that. They just, know, they just know they're hungry. They don't know mm -hmm. why they're hungry. They just yeah. know they're hungry. So... The parents keep feeding them, and then they eat too. And it's just, it's a, it's a, um, it's a horrible cycle. So that's a long, but so for me, I, I'm keto lifestyle, low sugar, um, um, low carbohydrates, and then um, paired with intermittent fasting. And for me, um, you know, I, um, I, I on days that work out, I'm getting older now. So on days that work out, I'll get up and have like a green smoothie in the morning. And then give it an hour to digest a little bit, and then I'll run. I'm, I feel I feel much better that way than when I used to. We used to um, have dinner at six, intermittent fast, and then if I couldn't get my running in the morning, what happened, Roman, is I'd wait until lunch. I had I work until lunch, and then like, okay, now I got a gap, and then I'd go in that sun like David Goggins in the middle of the day at two o'clock and run six miles in that <laughs> 98 degree weather, and I would I would I mean I could finish it, I could do it, but I was I was shot for three days. You know, my 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 watch would tell me that I need, you know, five days to recover. <laughs> I, was, I was drained. I mean, when your yeah. watch says, "Hey, old man, you need to sit your down for a little," bit, you know what I mean. So 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 for me, that little bit of food on workout days, okay, and that, for me that's three days a week. So on workout days, a little bit of food in the morning, like smoothie food, like you know, like like it makes like helps my body like be better. But days I'm not. I'm not working out. I'm not eating anything until noon. And then if 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 I don't have to, or if I'm not hungry, I'll let it go to dinner. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I just, I'll, I'll let it run. So you, so I mean, you can have black coffee. 
you know, you can have tea, no, listen, coffee, no sugar, no nothing, just just straight black, tea, uh, just black, black coffee. You can have tea, nothing in it, and as much water as you can drink. And then they're like keto drinks you can do with apple cider vinegar, some sea salt, some squeeze some lemon in there. Does lemon have a couple of calories in it? Yes. Does it technically break a, a fast? Yes. But lemon in your water is one calorie. It's not going to throw you off much. Is it? Is it breaking a fast? Yes. Is it going to metabolically change you? Not much, right? So, yeah. so you know, there's some there's some drinks that I that I make, um, 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 you know, to, to drink when I'm fasting. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that, those are the two things on the diet side. And then workout wise, I run twice a week, Monday Friday, anywhere between four and seven miles is where I am now. I, you know, six months ago I was at one and three miles. You know what I mean? It just keeps it just keeps moving up. You know, I'm, yeah. um, I, I like to get to a point where I can run. You know, where I'm running ten miles twice a week. I kind of like to get to twenty miles a week or two runs would be nice. It's that's not too long. It's not too crazy. You know, I won't hurt myself, and then it also get me in like, you know, like a half marathon shape, so I can just go. On. It's kind of where my goal is. You know, I'm not trying to run. I'm really not even trying to run marathons. I'm not trying to get to. But I'm, I would like to be able to run fifteen miles. You know what I mean? But anyway, and so that, that's yeah. that. Then. Then I lift weights one day, which is, it's not even weights, it's in my house. You know what I mean? I do like push-ups, sit-ups, you know, pull-ups, um, you know, some um, oblique work and, you know, a bunch of yoga stuff really is what it is. You know, some handstand work, you know, that, and then um, um, I have 30-pound adjustable dumbbells and, and go at it. Um, I wear myself the hell out, though. I mean, I do lunges. <laughs> I do like a hundred lunges. I mean, I just, I, I mean, like it, the the three pound adjustable dumbbells and a pull up bar, and I am wearing, I am wearing it out. You know what I mean? So, Dude, it doesn't um, take much. It doesn't it, take it much doesn't. equipment. You don't need much. You, if you have body weight, you can throw that around and and you'll get yourself a dang good workout. I've, I'm the testament to that because I've, I started cutting down the weights just because I, I, I was like too bulky. I felt like for a while. Um, yeah. But I, but I like all the things you're saying with the intermittent fasting. I was, uh, I'm still kind of on it, but like, even when I was big on it in NASCAR, like, because the way my schedule worked out was I would do all my, I would do all my morning workouts fasted. Um, cause right it, was just, it was just all, uh, cause I get there and the first thing I did 8am was workout. That was on my yeah. schedule. And so yeah. I would just go there, fasted workout. I'd get that all in. And then, um, we'd be done by nine, nine thirty, And then we'd go out to the pit pad and we would have, uh, we would like support the other teams in practicing. And so I didn't need to be like, I was sure I was hungry, but I didn't need fuel for that technically. Yeah. So then yeah. I, and then like come 11, 1130, that's when I would basically go back to the weight room and have my protein shake. And I would, yeah. and, and I would have, they had, we were sponsored by EAS and I had all this supplements and everything. And so I'd just start off with a protein shake, have a big lunch after that eat dinner, call it a night. And then I wouldn't eat again until the next morning. And, and I felt great. I was, I was still even gaining weight too. I mean, I, I was, yeah. I was lifting hard. I was working out almost twice a day, uh, every day and I was getting strong and, but I just wasn't eating as often, but my meals were bigger. Yeah. I yeah. Was, and so yeah. like, even, even though I wasn't, I wasn't really paying attention to any of my, my sugar intakes or, or anything like that, but just giving my body that digestive rest was just something that I felt like uh, was good for me. And then it was also like, like I wish I was doing the smoothies I do now back then, yeah. because then the first thing I put in my body, and like even when I do this now, it's like the first thing I put in my body, I try and make sure it is all the nutrients that I need and just all like kind of kind of my basic necessities that touch that base that touch all the right bases, so that I'm not just putting something that's uh those cheap worthless calories kind of in my body the first thing after uh, a decently long fast yeah yeah what you just what you just said is um maybe the most important thing said this entire podcast is that um one of the one of the absolute pillars um in my opinion to good health and maybe to share with some of these doctors i mentioned ron patrick especially um is that is that you start the day with a with a I mean, green smoothies is to me is, is optimal, and Ron Patrick says a green smoothie is the, is the most biologically available, the, the healthiest thing, the healthiest, most biologically available substance that you can put in your body, right? right? Wow. So, um, um, you want and you want to start the day with that because it again, 
you 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 satisfy your body's needs right off the bat and then the body's not going to be hungry the rest of the day the body you want your your it releases atp that and the liver goes oh we got all these nutrition all this all this kale and spinach and and bok choy and sweet pea and and uh and apple and all these and, and some ginger we got there and some some parsley and some water oh man the body goes oh this is all i need so then the, what the liver does is start kicking out ATP. So you wonder, how come I'm not hungry at noon? Let me tell you why you're not hungry at noon. Because you started your day with the green smoothie. So you can you can ride past noon you know, in, into the night because your, your body's satisfied. If, if you start out and you have sugar, you have, you have a big bowl of sugar, you know, and, or, or call it cereal, whatever, and you start your day with that, you, you, now, you, now you can't produce any ATP and you're going to be be hungry all day um yeah i mean that the, the starting the day out with the healthiest food you can put in your body green smoothie is absolutely the way to go yeah and i and i always tell people because like i had people reach out to me asking about like advice on um on intermittent fasting and things like that because they were like but man i'm so hungry in the morning and like i have my whole day and i'm like it, it doesn't have to be don't eat until noon you can you can eat right when you wake up at eight and then just cut out at six, you know, it doesn't, it's like work with your schedule. I mean, if you need that energy in the morning and you need to, you need that, that little, that boost, that whatever food is going to give you, take it, you know, it's yeah. like guess and check, but like, you don't have to, cause I, I was, I was telling people that and then they try it and then they'd be like, man, like my, the first part of my day went to shit and they're a hairstylist and they have no energy while they're blow drying someone's hair. I'm like, fix it. You know, <laughs> if it doesn't work. Yeah. If it doesn't work try something new it's like that and i think that some people just whether it's not understanding or just lack of uh of experimentation and getting creative and trying different things it's like some people will just settle for something that they think is the usual my body feeling like shit like i'm me like staying hungry all the time like man i don't know why i'm hungry at 10 p.m and i have to go downstairs and get a nightcap and things like that it's like it's it's sometimes it's crazy to me just to think about yeah i, I agree and you know it's funny you you um um sparked a thought in my head is that um um and, and, and i'm sure there are more ways than this but two ways are are um are apparent to me and one way is um um like working out you can you can there's a I, 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 I it's just, just in my head, two ways. I'm sure there are more, but one way you can do it is, is incrementally. You can say, okay, if you normally eat at eight o'clock, make it nine o'clock. Just make mm -hmm. it nine o'clock, and then eat at nine o'clock for a month. And then, and I mean, it's how I started with, it's how I started with meditation. I go, I go, I'm gonna meditate, and I, and not everybody's like, so. I mean, it's like, you know, read, I read uh, par, uh, uh, the Power of Habit by uh, who was it? Was that? I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember his name. But anyway, anyway, to read the power of habit. So we're talking about setting setting micro goals and slowly growing. So my goal, you'll you'll crack up on this, Roman. So my goal <laughs> when I started meditating was, okay, Rod, I don't want to meditate. I know I don't want to meditate. It's, it's, <laughs> it's boring. I'm sitting there, nothing's happening. Like I don't want to do it, but I know it's gonna be good for me. So how can I how can I develop a habit that I really don't want to do? I go, okay, listen, like power habit. I'm gonna meditate for one minute in the morning. One, I'm gonna set my for 60 seconds, and I'm gonna relax my body, focus on my body, and, and, and I'm gonna do that. I'm, I'm gonna do that for a month. I did it for a month, dog. <laughs> and then I go, okay, the next month I'm gonna make it one minute in the morning and one minute at night. And I am not kidding. I'm being dead. One minute, and then and then this is 2000, like 16. Okay, and then in February I'm gonna do it two minutes, and then, and then in March I'm gonna do three minutes and then I, I mean that's that's how i got up and i got up to like a half hour and then i, I, I receded back another 10 minutes but like yeah. but that's how i built the practice like with with slow so all i have to say is with fasting you could say okay if you normally whenever you normally eat let's say you eat at eight okay for the next month eat it don't have anything to eat until nine just make it incremental you can do it that way and then you go, then you go 10, 11, you move it back, right? In, in a month, that gives you time your body to adjust and so you're not so crazy. Okay, the other way to do it is this, is the David Goggins, um, Jocko Willick way. And that is, um, 
and it's funny. And, and I actually got this saying from a good friend of mine, Jim Schill, who said, who started fasting before I did and kind of introduced me to it. And he said, you know what, Rod? When my stomach growls, I love it. Because I tell my stomach and my body, you need to shut the F up because you work for me. No more, no more of you telling me when I need to go eat. This is my stomach and my brain trying to tell my consciousness to yes. take your happy A downstairs and open the fridge. But I don't want to do that. So who's the boss? Are, are you the boss or am I the boss? And actually, I'm the damn boss. And every time my stomach growls, I go, oh, are you hungry? Well, sorry, mother, you ain't getting any food. I don't care how much you growl and I don't care how much hunger that you put in my consciousness. I am not feeding your fat butt. Okay? <laughs> I'm in yeah. control of this monster. So when he said that to me, I was like, oh, I, love, I go, I, go oh, I love that. I go, I go, like, that's, I go, dude, I go, thank you, Jim. I go, I, I'm giving him a shout out, Jim Schiff. He said, I, he told me that. I went, wow. So like, so when my body's like, because here's the thing, when you're running and, you're, and your legs say, you know, you're training uh, in, the, in the hot box for wrestling, and you get a little tired, you go, oh, my body's not 100% coach. I'm gonna go ahead and take a nap. No, you, you, you push through, right? Your body resists and you push through. We're athletes, we always do that, right? If you're not an athlete, you do that at work. You do that when you read, you do that with your kids. Your kids give you feedback, do you quit? No, you push through. Oh, yeah. Why is hunger any different? How, how, is, how is being hungry any different than being tired? Or, or having to go pick up your kids when you're tired. You don't want to, but you do it. You push through. So he gave me that realization. I was like, wow, I'm being a punk. I'm, al I'm allowing my body to tell Rod Smith's consciousness what to do. And I literally get out of bed, go downstairs, and feed myself when I know it's bad for me. Because, because the body, because you're growling. And I go, you know what? I'm changing the game. When my stomach growls, I go, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you hungry? Well, guess what? <laughs> you can shut your mouth because you ain't get any food. Like I control that body. I make all the moves. I'll tell you when to sleep. I'll tell you when to eat. I'll tell you when to go. Like I run everything. No more. No more. So I'm, I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but like it was a, it was an eye opener for me that like it's not just athletically where you have to push through, or work wise where you have to push through, or relationships where you have to push through. If you really want to get healthy, you've got to take command over your body and understand that there will be resistance. Your, your stomach's not used to intermittent fasting. Your stomach doesn't know. Your stomach's like, hey, hey, hey Mr. Pop-Tart, where in the hell is my, <laughs> my pancakes? You yeah. know what I'm saying? So when you don't give it pancakes, when you give it a green smoothie for the first time and it's not sweet and sugary and and in um you know in, in in powder and cream sugar puffs and in syrup and carbohydrates and pancakes when you give it green smoothie don't be surprised if your gut starts grumbling we don't want that we want sugar of course it wants sugar but you have to tell your stomach to shut the up like i am in control and and i, I won't beat it anymore but like but i but when my stomach growls i go and, and, the, and the funny part is, who do you like, think you're talking to? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 tell you, I tell you what's funny. My stomach doesn't growl much anymore. I swear to God, and my stomach knows. Don't waste your time. Yeah. All you're gonna do is piss him off. If you growl, Rod may not eat until tomorrow. He might just go day fast. Like, oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. I fed. I fed you six hours ago, and you got the balls to seriously try to growl at me in a meeting in front of these people. Listen, I'm not feeding you until tomorrow. Yeah, just uh -huh. because, just for that, you're not going to eat anything until Saturday. Say something, anything else, say something again. You won't eat till Sunday. Watch, try oh, me. Man, so like, I love my, that. My, my, stomach, my stomach is like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grow, yeah. you grow at me in front of a meeting, in front of people, in front of my parents. In oh. public? Yeah, in public. Yeah, in public. <laughs> yeah. Man, and, and you touched on something big there because I've seen it in as a sports psychology major I've seen it a lot in incremental changes versus like essentially 
going cold turkey or starting something and Jedi mind tricking yourself into just doing it. Uh, no, one of the number one reasons why people uh, don't adhere to workout programs, say January 1st comes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all this, is because they don't think about working that into their schedule. They don't think about working those incremental changes. They're like, okay, I'm just going to buy this gym membership and I'm going to go five days a week starting tomorrow. I haven't been to the gym in months. And then next thing you know, they're missing days, they're sore, they can't go back at it, boom. Then they're they, like mentally, they're already out of it. But then you also have the people that just, like I said, Jedi mind trick, those David Goggins people that really just kind of just cut it. Either, either they cut the habit cold turkey or they start it up and then they're, they're just super consistent with it. Um, but it's so crazy that like, I think food is just a different animal. Because like, even like, I mean, I'm glad that wrestling kind of gave me I'll, I'll be completely honest. I had a really shitty relationship with food growing up. I, I mean, I, it was to the point where I was watching the food channel so much because I wanted to eat that food. I wanted to eat that food so damn bad. And I, if I couldn't have it, I was going to watch someone else eat it uh, or I'll watch at least I'll watch someone else cook it on the food channel. And, yeah. and, but at the same time, it was like, I was also sneaking downstairs at, at uh, 1030, pulling a pack of pop tarts in and hiding the wrappers and, in like little like crooks and nannies just, <laughs> just to be it. found later. Like it was just like, I was on the top bunk of my bed and I just had a bad relationship with it. But now yeah. it's like, I don't, I don't really have a sweet tooth. Um, I can really kind of control my hunger, control like when I want to eat. And so I, it did develop some good habits, but even like back in the day, it was like when I was in school, kids were like, man, it's like, I would love to wrestle, but I just love food so much. And everybody, like, and, that, and that's, like, the only thing, I could never do that. Like, I have a lot of praise for wrestlers because what they do with losing weight and things like that. It's, like, something about, like, the food that people eat and the habits they developed over the years, whether it has been, like, made way too much sugar or just something that they feel like they need. It's, like, you could go 30 days without food and you'll still be fine. Like, and you'll still be fine. Like, it, you, may, you may be hungry, you know, but – You'll, you'll be alive and you'll still be breathing, but people, it's like, people won't go. It like, like I, I do like a, even I, I wrote a Instagram post talking about my five non -nego like non-negotiables. It, yeah. like, it was like connecting, feeding my mind, uh, sweating, drinking a lot of water. And uh, I forgot what the last one was, but it wasn't food. It wasn't food oriented <laughs> because I knew, I know in my heart that I don't need food all the time. Like, yeah, yeah. Those are my five negotiables to make a good day. Yeah. I've had great days when I fasted. I've had great days when I didn't eat. And so it wasn't a non-negotiable for me. And it's like, so for so many people, it's like, they just like, they, whether they, they are finding something, something about that food gives them a warm place in their heart, you know, reminds them of grandma's cooking, mm -hmm. whatever brings them back to better times, whatever it is. It's like food is always, is like, it's a different kind of animal when you start trying to take away food or start trying to, uh, limit people on what they can and can't eat and it's like it's a it's a different animal that gut mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the second brain too yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. And, and but like it can just be be filled with just that sh that trash and that sugar and that second brain can start controlling you to the point where you could like essentially just let go of yourself too yeah quickly things like yeah. that it's wild to see it really is and like I'm, I'm glad that you're touching on it because it's uh it's something that's prevalent with me and i because i've had i wouldn't i would never say i had an eating disorder but i had disorderly acts and yeah. it was because it was due to sport i'm glad it was due to a good cause where i can say yeah. like i got my hand raised and and, yeah. and everything like that but it was not easy and it and it was borderline disorderly but i mean now i'm good <laughs> yeah yeah. Like now I've got, I've got a grip on my, 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 how I can eat and just know that like, even if I do need that M&M's ice cream sandwich that I do love every night, not yeah. every night, not every night, but I yeah. know that when I want it, I can have it. Yeah. Because if, if you don't have it for a while, you can have it. Like, 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 um, I'm trying to think about like, about how like the human brain, um, how human brains, um, work, work at this, but like, um, we like hear the negative. You know, you hear fasting, people go, oh, I'll never eat again. And all these visions of starving and emasculated kids. You're like, oh, yeah. Man. I, I, that, that floods the brain. That's not it. It is, it literally is just another um, self-mastery that 
that is going to dramatically extend your life. Um, just just intermittent fasting, like three days a week. Just don't eat anything till noon. And I know you feel like you're gonna die. You won't. I know you feel like my hands are shaking, but listen, you're gonna live. And here's the thing, like you said, just do it for a couple of months. Trust me, in two or three months, you're gonna be doing will be nothing. I mean, it just takes a little while for the body to develop. And yeah, your stomach is going to fight you on it. Believe me, you're not producing any ATP. You're always hungry. Like, yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You're not hungry. Your body is unable to stop you from eating. But being hungry is 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 a sensation yes your body does not need fuel if if when i had a gut and i had a gut like i i know i don't need fuel i'm hungry but that's and that's the that's the part that helped me like really get going because i'm like i'm hungry and i shouldn't be hungry like there are kids in africa that are missing that run that are running marathons trying to like train their way out of a bad spot that are like like and they're running like how can i be hungry with all of this food energy on my body like i've got a gut like like it's it's not that i'm hungry something is biologically wrong with me because my mm. body doesn't need fuel i mean i mean i wouldn't have stores of energy on me if i needed fuel you know um yeah you know so it's uh, i and again, I, I'll just kick it one more time, glass tires. But I, I, I love, um, I love when my stomach growls. I, I love the hunger <laughs> pain. I just, I just go, man, you better. I mean, like, I just look at myself, like, you better listen. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it, and it, and it breeds like self confidence and self assuredness and like every and my brother come you love this that's my last story i'll tell you like, <laughs> so my, my brother just started intermittent fasting about about three months ago and he called me the other day and he said todd smith i love him to death my best friend in the world todd called me he said ron i had a breakthrough i'm like what's that he's like well i'm uh i'm at uh, i can't remember which restaurant i'm at a restaurant with clients and i'm taking them out and you know it's lunch and and it was a lunch menu and all they had was crap it was all like lots of bread and lots of of, uh, of of potatoes bread potatoes everything that i should be eating is all on there and i thought about it and i go i'm just gonna get a salad and and, uh, and everybody all the guys were like oh are you kidding me salad. <laughs> so they're busting my chops and I, and I and i just got a salad you know with, with chicken on it and kept it lean and mean and and uh it went keto and i and i go and, and it was like and I was cool with it. I go, and, I, and I was, and I was cool with it. Like, like <laughs> I'm, 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 and it's so huge. Like, I made a decision about my food that that was not nearly as satisfying in the moment. Like, I, I kind of had like a burger and French fries, and like, and like really like made myself got that that high. But instead of doing that, I made the best decision for my longevity in that moment under that pressure. I've made a decision about my food, which is going to enhance my life. I've, I've made a conscious. So that is a that is a breakthrough when you can when you can start to make decisions that, like I said, I love myself enough to do the things that I don't want to do. I love myself enough to do the things that I don't want to do. Like that. That is self-love at the highest level. Doing the things that your body's saying you should eat, don't eat. Your body's saying you need to get in bed, go get in bed. If, if you're tired, you need more sleep. Like, so, so you know when it's 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, you know, listen, you should be getting in bed. Yeah. Listen to your conscience. L like, listen to your conscience and do that. Uh, and you, that's how you, you live a, a healthy, longer, productive life. Like, listening to those things and doing the things that may not be pleasant in the short term but you understand are going to have long-term positive implications man i'm i i can <laughs> i can say that i've never been in todd's shoes before i've i've still never i've actually <laughs> never ordered a salad out 
<laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, and and I'm, I'm the guy that's poking fun at, at the other guy that ordered a salad. I'm like, well, I'm definitely not ordering that rabbit food. <laughs> but, all jokes of love, jokes of love. I, I know. I, I, know. Like, I like poking people. Uh, but that is funny. I'll have to. I'm, I'm going to be thinking of you the, the first time I order my salad and be like, this one's for you, Todd, Rod. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> oh, man. But, shoot, we're about, we're about an hour and a half in. And so uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up real quick. But um, I appreciate your time and everything. And uh, this is one conversation that, that, uh, that I think will ha definitely have to be extended. I'll probably have yeah. you on again because yeah, this, let's do it this again. was phenomenal. Wait, 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 wait. And we, we got a lot more to talk about, no doubt. A lot more we, to we, talk we, about. We, we, didn't, we didn't get into the, to the Rodney Patrick stuff. And the, I mean, we got, we, got a, we, got another, we got another hour to go for sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll get you on again. But um, for everybody who wants to follow you and, uh, and everything that you're doing, like where can they find you? I'm at uh, Rod, I think it's, I think it's Rod Smith. ND, I think is my uh, my Instagram handle. I should probably know that, right? Uh, <laughs> no Rod, Smith, Rod, yeah, Rod, Rod Smith ND um, is my Instagram handle, and uh, and you know anything update that's going on, that's where you can find it. And um, uh, and you know, feel free to message me at any time if you, if you have a question about uh, longevity or, or health. If if I can't answer it, I will, and if I if I know who can answer it, I'll definitely point you in the right direction. I'm all about people living longer, more productive, healthy lives, and um, and uh, and I'm here to help, no doubt about it. Wonderful, Rod. Thanks again. I do appreciate you for your time. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, Roman. Let's do this again, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, won't be long now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs>